The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Day by day and with each passing moment Strength I find to meet my trials here Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, John 6.63. Let's open our Bibles tonight to that passage in the sixth chapter of John. On this occasion, Jesus' teaching became so hard for the listeners that most of them turned away from him. He turned to his apostles, at that time his disciples, and said, Wilt thou also go away? Peter's response is interesting. Lord, to whom should we go? Thou hast the words of life, John 6, 66. Our subject tonight, wonderful words of life. Wonderful, great, awesome, tremendous words. Let's look at that a moment. In the Old Testament, the term word is davar. It's a technical term, usually used of God's word. D-A-V-A-R, davar, God's word. Pointing to whom? Timothy, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3.15. Timothy, those Old Testament scriptures were talking to you about Jesus. They are the Word pointing to the Word incarnate. In the New Testament, however, we have two terms for words. Let's look at John 1.1 1, 1 first. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I want to underline that word, word, and tell you that it's L-O-G-O-S, logos. Logos, according to the Greeks, was the flux in the universe, that which kept everything moving. In fact, there was a philosopher named Heraclitus who was called the weeping philosopher. Why? He was standing over a creek one day that was so small he could straddle it with his feet, and he looked down at it and he began to cry. And someone said, Heraclitus, why are you crying? He said, because I just realized I can't see the same creek twice. Well, what do you call that movie? I don't know anybody crying over a creek ought to be quoted, but that's what he did. And I, why are you crying? Well, I, the flux is moving. That's what he called it, the logos. John said, that's not right. It's not the movement in the universe. It's not the force contrary to what the movie said in recent years. It's the person being called Jesus. When John said in the beginning was the Logos, that was revolutionary. Absolutely unheard of before then. This is the message of God in a living being. That word was made flesh and dwelt among us. But we have another term in the, in the New Testament, translated word. Let's go over to Romans 10:17. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now that term word isn't logos. That's R-A-M-A. -A. It's pronounced chrema, as if you were breathing the R. Well, what does that word mean? Well, let's run over to Ephesians 6.17 for a moment before we figure out what chrema means. Wonderful words of life. In Ephesians 6, 17, we're told, take the helmet of, salva of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now you have that term word again. It's chrema here. What does the word chrema mean? It means God's breathed Word. Does that sound familiar to you? 
God's breathed word. That word which brings life because it has God's breath in it. Listen now to 2 Timothy 3.16 with a little more appreciation. All Scripture is God-breathed. In the King James has inspired by God. The word is theonoustos. It means God breathed it. How did man become a living soul? God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. When God's breath is in something, that is alive and living and stronger than a two-edged sword. From piercing even to dividing a son of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When I pick up this message, it's alive, it's living. And yet I can remember in my lifetime a gospel preacher, I suppose he was a gospel preacher, standing in a pulpit saying, God, come down and bring alive your dead letter so we can preach it this morning. Brothers and sisters, the wonderful words of life are living. It's a living Message. It's the only message I know that changes lives, changes families, changes communities, changes nations. Why? Because the seed is the Word of God. It's a living, breathing entity that can change my life. Go back to John 6, 63 now. That's why Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Had you ever stopped to think that there's never been a Christian where the Word of God hasn't gone? We have people walking around this country saying, let's sit out in a cornfield and wait for something to happen to me. Let's have a feeling or, or some kind of touchy-feely kind of thing. Let's have a convulsion or let's go down to the mourner's bench and wait for the Holy Spirit and all that sort of thing. That's not where the life is. That would be like trying to plant a garden without seed. Let's just sit out here and wait for God to do it. God's already shown us how to do it. Let's go to Matthew 11 for a moment and notice something here. We sang the song a moment ago. Let's look at the passage. Verse 28. The great invitation, right? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now I hear people say, they, hear, they see the word yoke in English and they go, oh, I have to be yoked with Jesus like two oxen are yoked together. No, it's not what he means. In that time, when you were a student of a teacher, you were yoked to this teacher. What Jesus was saying was, take my school upon you and learn of me. Take, come and be at my feet. Let me teach you. Why? Because the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And the words that I will give you will give you life. That's why he came, folks, that we might have life and that more abundantly. We'll run over to John 8, 31 and 32. Some Jews were following one day and he turned to them that were following him and said, If... You continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. While I'm thinking about it, let's run back to the Old Testament a minute. And go to the book of Isaiah and look at 820. Isaiah 820. You remember this one, Riley? This was our motto in Holy Spirit class, you remember? <laughs> To the law and to the testimony. Now watch Isaiah. If they, anybody who claims to teach the word of God, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no, now the King James has light. I'm going to translate that dawn light. There isn't even the beginning of light in them if they don't speak according to this word. Why? Because these are the wonderful words of life. I want you Jews to teach this to your children when you're sitting down and when you're standing up and when you're walking in the way and wherever you are, you teach it to the children. And those Jews said, all right, we're going to run down to the store and buy a Bible and read it to our children. What store? And where are you going to get one? There was only one scroll and it was in the side of the ark. That's where Moses put it. So how are those parents going to teach those children 
Day after day after day after day after day, they had to memorize, folks, the wonderful words of life in order to teach it to their children. And Moses said, don't you dare add to it, don't you dare take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I give you this day, Deuteronomy 4.2. Imagine that. But I will say this, a question comes to my mind. Why did God speak to me anyway? What is it that is in his character that would give me this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful word? Why? Well, I know this. He loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know who said that? The Son of God said that about himself. John 3, 16. He was talking to Nicodemus when he said it. God loves us. God's love is the greatest kind of love. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For, scarcely for a righteous man would some die, or perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What kind of love is that? Human beings might die for someone that they know, that they had care about or respect toward, but God died for me when I was still a sinner. God loved me as much as God is ever going to love me before I ever became a Christian. I didn't earn his love by becoming a Christian. I accessed it. It was always there. This being who is beyond my comprehension wants me to be near him. It's how it started out, you remember. He walked with man. He talked with man face to face. And we lost that. He provided a way to get it back with the wonderful Wonderful words of life. The breathed message of God. He spoke to us because He loves us. I think a second reason He spoke to us. God desires beings to love Him. God desires beings to love Him. He made us in such a way that we can actually respond in love toward Him. Look at Matthew 5.45. God wanted beings who could respond to him. He said that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. God is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. 1 Timothy 4.10 Why would an all-powerful God need man? I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know he created us in such a way that we can choose him. And he wants that. And so he shows us the plan by which we may choose him. That's why he spoke to us. If you'll think about it a moment. If God is all in all and there's no other being, who knows that God exists? Except God. And so God made it possible by creating beings who are in themselves creative, who have a will, who could voluntarily love him. Let us make man in our image. God is a creative being. So are we. God is a being with a will. So are we. We have been created in the image of God. I take it this way. Maybe I'm wrong in saying this. But in making man, God took a chance. In this sense. Man could reject God. He has the will and he does it often. But God provided for the rejection. Look at 1 Peter 1.19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, watch this, who verily was foreordained, when? Before the foundation of the world. Had you ever wondered why Adam and Eve didn't die the day that God said they would? You eat of that tree, dying thou shalt die. You ought to study that phrase. The King James has, thou shalt surely die. The Hebrew has, dying thou shalt die. What's it mean? 
Every place in the New Testament, Old Testament where that phrase is used, it means capital punishment. Your body will be put to death. Why didn't they die that day? Somebody was foreordained before the foundation of the world to take their place. God pictured it for them. He killed some animals, took the skins, and covered them. Don't you see the picture of God's grace? Don't you see the picture of why Adam and Eve didn't die that day? Somebody had died for them. In prospect, Paul discusses all of that in the third chapter of Romans when he asked the question, was God just in doing that? Yes. Because as God looked down through time, he could see that cross. And he could forgive men in the Old Testament because of that cross. And so why, do he, why by him do be, we who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. What wonderful words of life that this God Provided even for a rebellious man. God loves us. And so he spoke to us. If you don't believe that, go home tonight and read the book of Hosea. What a great picture of God's love. Gomer was a rebellious wife, wasn't she? Pictured rebellious Israel. All the time that Gomer was out rebelling against her husband and life and God... Hosea took care of her, provided for her, uh, uh, her uh, uh, took care of her. Gomer was following after her lovers, Hosea 2, 1 through 5, but she didn't know the Hosea was taking care of her. When she became old and used up, God said, you take her back. That analogy pictures God and his people. Israel went out and worshipped idols. God protected her. She rebelled against God. God took care of her and pleaded for her return. His love was never defeated by rebellious Israel. Why did God speak to me? He loves me. This I know. For the wonderful words of life tell me so. I think there's another reason God spoke to me. Look at Psalm 8.5. Psalm 8, 5. God recognizes His creation, man, as a dignified being. That's a strange thought, I think, for most of us. God recognizes His creation, man, as a dignified being. Listen to what He said about Him. Thou hast made Him a little lower... Now underline the word lower. It means down here, not up there. He doesn't mean lower in character or lower in essence. He means He put us on earth and the angels up there. Thou hast made Him a little lower than the Elohim, the mighty ones, the angels, and hast crowned Him, man, watch this, with glory and honor. I want to think about Adam for a moment. Crowned with glory and honor. Perfect. Sinless. Here's your wife, Adam. Perfect. Sinless. Eve, don't, don't reach for that. You know he never said that to her? He stood right there and watched her take it. She gave to her husband with her. He was right there. They both rebelled against God, and here you had this being crowned with glory and honor. Perfect. And he sinned. What is God going to do now? God, who is just and holy, now has a problem to solve because God's justice demands sinlessness to be living with him. But now he's got this human being who was perfect and he sinned. How is he going to solve the problem? You need a perfect man to take that perfect man's place who sinned. What did God do? Sent His Son. To do what? To bring us back to the state of glory and honor. That's why Hebrews 2.9 is in the Bible. We see Jesus, made a little over the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. He's perfect. He's perfect. Sinless. That He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2.9. Well, there you are. There is God solving the problem that Adam caused. 
And if you look at Ephesians 4, 24, here's why God spoke to us. We can come back to the position Adam have if we'll put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We are a dignified being when we are in Christ, recognized so by God, made a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor. I think there's another reason God spoke to us these wonderful words of life. We need to know ourselves. Brother Cates, the other day in class, one of our first-year students said he was having trouble finding himself. I suggested he look in the mirror because I could see him perfectly well from where I was sitting. Have you heard that stuff from people? I'm trying to find myself. Haven't you got a mirror? And what's that mean anyway? Well, I tell you what you could do. You could study the Greek philosophers who told you to know yourself. That was their great philosophy. Know thyself. Get to know yourself. Well, how do you do that? And here comes Jeremiah in his day and saying, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his own steps, Jeremiah 10, 23. So how are you going to know yourself looking in yourself? Because it's not there. There's no knowledge of self in self. So here are the Greek philosophers saying, know yourselves. I've got a student saying he's trying to find himself. I told him to look in the mirror. And I said to him, after I said that silly thing, I said, I'll tell you what the Lord said. He said, deny yourself. I don't think the Greeks liked that. I know they didn't like his preaching, but those wonderful words of life, which were to the Greeks foolishness, are the secret to life. Forget yourself. Deny yourself. Listen to that message. Doesn't make sense. But without God's having spoken to us, we'd never know that secret of the happy life. Just forget yourself. Deny yourself. And take up your cross. Well, what do you do with a cross? You put yourself to death. It's what they used to cross. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his electric chair, his hangman's noose, his hypodermic needle. That's what he was saying. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. How do I do that? Because I've got all of these things I'm worried about, thinking about, did you know that every month the electric company sends me a bill? Can you imagine? And the phone company, and the gas company, not the water company, I have a pump. But all those people, say every, and, every, and then all these doctor bills, they're for me, not Dorothy. I, I'm a hypochondriac. I get a little twinge, I want to go to eight doctors. No, that's not true either. But we've got all these bills. I got, uh, and then, not only that, my children, you know what? You know why we have grandchildren? They are a reward for not killing ours. It's the only reason we have them. I've got all of these things going on in my life. There's work, and there's a house, and there's this and that and the other thing. How can I deny myself? God says, you love me above everything else. And everything else takes care of itself. Matthew 22, 37. Wonderful words of life. Do you know why we're here? Listen to the psalmist. Thou art worthy, O God, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure were all things that are and were created. Everyone that is called by my name, Isaiah wrote, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him, Isaiah 43, 7. Godless life, what a folly. What a folly. But the wonderful words of life. I think one other reason that God spoke to us. 
I need to know what God wants me to do. And so he spoke to me. I need to know his will. Hebrews 10.10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. How much time? Without the knowledge of God's will, I cannot enter heaven. I cannot be sanctified. I cannot be set apart. I cannot know the truth that makes me free. Wonderful words of life. Look at Revelation 1 for a moment. This word is so powerful that one of the books in the New Testament tells us a very much, a very unusual thing. This is verse 3 of Revelation 1. And it says, Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy. That term read there is a public reader. Just picking up the book in public and reading it to hearers. This message is so powerful, it brings a blessing. Our students study all day long, mostly to pass tests. You know, I've been working in the schoolhouse all the live long day. I've been working in the schoolhouse just to pass. That's why they work in the schoolhouse, just to pass. But even though they're doing it for that reason, I watch their lives change from studying the Word of God day after day after day after day. Let me recommend to you tonight the breathed wonderful message of a loving God who wants us to know Him. Thank you kindly for your attention. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Truth For The World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world. Jesus once told the Jews in John 8.32, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How can we continue in the word? How can we know the truth? We invite you to visit us at truthfortheworld.org. Bible courses, TV and radio programs, tracts and articles on common biblical questions are all available at truthfortheworld.org. Come hear the Bible. Come hear the truth. truthfortheworld.org Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear.